Hi everybody, um, I am Sara Örvall. Uh, I'm heading a department called Research and Development at Bonnier Group. And um, for you who does not know the Bonnier Group, we are a media publishing company. Uh, we're working more or less in all media areas. We do publish magazines, newspapers, books, we do TV, we have cinemas, um, and of course web and mobile. Uh, and we do that in 20 countries now. And my job um, is to try to find the next step within these different media areas. And as I'm sure you know, they're largely disruptive, all of them. It's certainly a market which is completely changing, which makes this job pretty interesting, I think. Um, then you can ask what kind of innovation are we looking for? And there's an interesting... McKinsey has this interesting database where they follow 1,000 companies uh, in 15 different industries, and they've done that for 40 years. And they try to see what are the successful sort of characteristics of the most profitable companies over the year. And not only do they find that these are the companies being most innovative, they're also the companies who have actually innovated completely new market segments. Um, not staying where they are, but sort of kept on moving. And that's what we try to do, and that's what we try to achieve. Like, what's the next market segment uh, within the media industry? There's another interesting study done by USC Marshall for uh, Global Innovation, and um, they've asked all the Standard & Poor top CEOs of the US, what are your key strategic priorities for the next coming five years? And more than 90% of them say that innovation is the key strategic um, challenge. However, more than 50% of the same CEOs say that they don't have any processes and they don't have the right people in place to make that innovation happen. Which is kind of interesting, speaking about that this is an area which needs more uh, processes and research and theories. Um, in this study, <laughs> there are four areas uh, that they talk about that are the main problems uh, in innovation. The first one being that big companies tend to be far too slow when there is a new technology happening, a new consumer demand arising. We just don't move quick enough and develop quick enough. And when we develop, we keep on uh, not having the DJ in place. All the innovation is happening in many places in the organization, and it's not coordinated. You don't find the synergies, and therefore the innovation tends to be too small. There is not enough power behind each of the innovation steps. And once there is innovation done, coordinated, the products become too bland, too sort of not exciting without the sort of cutting-edge um, aspects that they do need to compete in, in the new market. And, of course, there is a talent shortfall, which most of these CEOs see as the main problem. Like, who are going to do the innovation in that company? Who will these people be? And how do we attract them? And how do we keep them innovative? Not surprisingly, these four areas are kind of problems for Bonnier as well. <laughs> so these are things I face every day. So I figured this presentation, I'm going to stick to these four problem areas, problem areas for innovation and talk a little bit about how we've tried to overcome these problems of what we've done. I'm not saying that is the only way to do it or the best way to do it, but rather to just share the experience from our work. Um, I would do that using a case, uh, a project that we've done called Mag Plus, uh, and that is a development of digital magazines. So I'll use that as example as I move ahead. First thing, I think, when it comes to product development inertia. And the we feel in the organization is that we have to be super, super scary. And that is not a joke. <laughs> I really think that big organizations need a lot of ghosts in order to innovate. Because every successful organization become too secure, forget about how scary the external environment is, how fast it's changing, how many competitors that are moving up. Competitors that sometimes, in our case, might be two guys or girls in a garage somewhere in a completely different country. And they can seriously threaten our business. 
And we forget about that. And therefore, in any innovative organization, I think there are a lot of ghosts. And they keep on talking about these challenges. They keep on informing about what's going on. Therefore, everyone is constantly on the move, knowing unless we move, the ghost is going to get us. <coughs> also, kill your cash cows uh, may sound obvious, but we know for sure that many companies are fighting against change rather than embracing it. And if you're a media company, it's not easy to say that, okay, we have Dagens Nyheter, we have TV4, we have Express, and we have a book publishing company that's 200 years old. They're all super successful companies. We did our best year ever, 2010. But <laughs> we have to kill them. We have to do something else because we know for sure that they will continue to exist, but they will not be as big as we move ahead. And that hurts, and it's really hard to do that unless you have top management commitment to, to, be, to sort of <laughs> internally kill it, because otherwise, once again, the garage people will do it for you, so there is no alternative quite often. Uh, in our case, um, we did that <laughs> uh, with a project that was said called Mag Plus. This is a digital magazine uh, targeting to kill the print magazine, more or less. Um, and it says launch embarrassingly early on. That's another key learning we have in terms of, of product development inertia, that you can actually launch things much earlier these days than you used to be able to. And I'll talk more about it in a minute. What you see on the movie is a concept that we did for digital magazines. Um, I'm glad that I have a CEO who said, summer 2009, that digital magazines are going to happen. There's going to be an iPad at some time. We can start the project now. And this is now six months ahead of Steve Jobs announcing the iPad. It's eight months ahead of uh, the iPad being launched in the market. So we started this project. Um, and why did we start it that early? Well, because we know that when new technology like devices are introduced into the market, that is when change happens dramatically. The question about consumers driving change, definitely. Uh, because once the devices are out there, that's when you see giant leaps in consumer behavior. Therefore, that's when we need to innovate to be part of it. We also know that every time there's a new product coming out, if you're not there at the moment, someone will set the rules for you. They will decide, is it a free product or is it a paid product? Is it distributed via a network or via the actual manufacturers themselves, etc.? Oh, that's an interesting sound, sorry. <laughs> um, so we figure we're going to be there when it's launching, and we're going to be try to be cutting edge um, from a worldwide perspective. And that's pretty bold being one year. That's not what we usually do. So we built this prototype. Uh, as you can see, it's built on a piece of plastic. And we used a lot of just scotch tape, and we cut up pages, and we did it very manually. Um, we waited, and we waited for Steve to announce this iPad, and we waited, and nothing happened. And then we figured, like, okay, it's December, it's 2009, we don't know what to do. So we decided to post this video on Vimeo. And we literally just posted it and thought, maybe we'll get some feedback, maybe we'll get new energy into our project. Um, and the morning I woke up after we posted it, this video was on the front page of Wired and Gadget and Gizmodo, and I had journalists from New York Times and Financial Times on my voicemail. And we're like, oh my god, what happened? And it turns out that 500,000 people downloaded the video. And not only was that fun, obviously, <laughs> but primarily we get so much intelligent feedback. So our product development time was probably cut in half. Because all these clever, clever people downloaded the video, they wrote to us that had comments about how to improve it, what technology to use, how to sort of build that perfect digital magazines. And suddenly we had this dialogue with a worldwide crowd of people that we would never ever been able to access otherwise. Uh, and therefore, once the SDK was launched and it was possible to start to build on the iPad in January, we knew what we wanted to do, we knew what kind of product we wanted to build, and we had set six design principles built that this is what we're going to create, and we could launch on time. So April 3rd, when the iPad is launched, we launched Popular Science magazine, and it's only us and Time magazine who managed to do this on time. And I think it was only due to this video. So sometimes, launch embarrassingly early is the key, I think, 
critical step to, to cut development time. All right, this is just the proof of how difficult it was. This was the only iPad we had at that point in time. <laughs> we were like moving it up and down on printed magazines, like how will it look like? When you design for your hands, people will read with their hands, what will they do? Like, totally clueless. Um, second thing, uh, coordination chaos. How do you avoid that? In our company, we say we have a manic knowledge focus. And I think today there is no excuse whatsoever for anyone to not be informed because there are a number of these sites. This is actually an art project to start it with. It's um, wefeelfine.org. They scan all tweets and all Facebook updates every 10 minutes and they, they aggregate the data and they filter it on moods, on gender, on weather, on geography. And you can see like how people feel in different parts of the world. And whatever, I mean, this is just a stupid example, but there are so many ways to gather that data and know exactly how consumers behave, think, talk, what they do. And if you create that culture internally, that this is the thing we have to do, not only are people better informed, but you also avoid a lot of these uh, personal experience failures that you see a lot of, I think. The person in your development group who says, no, 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 that doesn't work, I've tried it before, no way. Because it's not a valid argument, or I don't believe in this personally, because you have so much information. So the, the discussion in the development process is all about how to interpret knowledge rather than having too many personal opinions. And in some old companies, that is true. <laughs> because you can get killed otherwise. Also, we've worked a lot with what we call creating coffee houses. You know, there's this book about how English people became clever when they abolished or took away the beer houses and instead introduced the coffee houses because that's where people met and they weren't drunk. So the whole enlightenment area started. Um, our coffee houses are not only like this, like coffee coffee houses. We do them virtually. Um, so we have a beta lab online where we test ideas, we post prototypes of new products. And we try to engage people internally to, to, to comment, try things, to, to argue about other ideas. But I think there are too few places where people meet in a relaxed way to discuss ideas. And not any good new product has ever come out of one person's brain. It has to be one idea built on the other idea, built on the next idea. And if you can create those places, you have a good... Um, possibility of, of innovating at least. Also, uh, as we heard previously in the talk, the experts won't be in the house anymore. We know that for sure. We definitely need to be much, much, much more open to new ideas from consumers, from experts around the world. And there are experiments done by Procter & Gamble, GE, who have done brilliant work in terms of engaging people outside of their company into the product development process and have really good results and based on that, Procter & Gamble say that they want to have 50% of all new, all new product development ideas from outside of the company. Um, and as I proved with that video, that's exactly when you get this energy also going in, in your development. However, once you open those doors, you better be prepared and know how to handle the input you get. Because you do get a lot. How do you answer 500,000 people when they have comments? Not everyone has, but there were a lot of them. How do you keep on encourage them? And I had this um, little bit fun example from Spotify. Uh, we were having a um, just internal meeting, and my colleague says, this what's new section on Spotify is so stupid because all of the artists they, they feature are dead. So I thought, ah, oh, that's a fun tweet. I'll tweet that one. So randomly I write, my colleague, colleague claims that 50% of artists featured on Spotify's what's new section are actually dead. That happens. Immediately, I get a lot of response on Twitter. One saying, right now, Django, Queen, Little Richard, Eddie Piaf, the Queen again, blah, 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 blah. More than 50% are dead, which is kind of weird in the what's new section. And this other guy <laughs> tweets, I'm going to meet with someone. I can ask him. I don't have a clue who he's meeting, but he says so. This is then happening. Not even one hour has passed when this happens. Spotify changes. Their what's new section? They put on only living artists. Obviously, I think this is so super cool. So I tweet again. Now Spotify is full of living people again. You can see that's eight hours. So there's just one hour in between. 
Thanks a lot, love you, because that's cool. Then, Spotify tweets back, someone I don't know. Great, isn't it? And I think this is like the beautiful, a beautiful example of how to handle input from consumers. Now, this wasn't because it was me doing it. It was obviously them having computers tracking as soon as there's Spotify mentioned on Twitter. And the, but they didn't only track it, they acted. And when they do that, you will love them forever. And I think more companies will have to find those processes like, okay, here's a really smart, clever input to my product. Not only do I need to change my product, I also need to feed back to the person who gave me that input. All right. Next area, uh, blend anonymous products. I find it very, very hard uh, in the development, much harder than I thought, to, to reprogram the brain, uh, to really completely find completely new ideas. If you're going to build the first car, which is this is among the first cars at least, uh, and you've only been transporting yourself on a wagon behind a horse, the first car you're going to build is going to look like a wagon behind a horse, even though there's no other reason for that. But that's the way you design. And you keep on doing that. And I think in any, every product development process, you have to understand that this is how we think. You cannot avoid that. You have to embrace that and then work against it. In our project, we have this little video that we kept on playing. Like, don't you ever des design a page flipping machine, <laughs> whatever you do. Because <laughs> if this industry is going to translate one thing from the print world to the digital world, it's not going to be the page flipping thing. Because <laughs> then we have problems. And we kept on joking about it, but that was good because that forced us to think, so what's fluid motion then? In what other ways can you read rather than flip pages? And what's the next step of reading? Um, and I think otherwise we'd probably done that PDF-style magazine. Also, we talk a lot about cross-functional teams. It's been talked about forever. Uh, this is literally the first popular science digital magazine we designed. Uh, we locked ourselves in a room for a weekend. We flew in our American print people, our best editorial people. We flew in our programmers and UX expert from England. And we had Ferelle at the headquarter for a weekend. We said, we're not leaving this room until we've designed this magazine, which is now a platform for around 30 other magazines as well. But the good thing about it was that when you have the print people talking about how they tell a story, what pace they use in a magazine, how they think when they compose a picture next to an image, next to a headline, and you have UX people next to it and the programmer, they can start to argue, they can really, really find the perfect solution. And I think too often in the product development process, the cross-functional thing is more like a meeting, where you have the digital guy next to some other guy next to a marketing person, and you sit there and you agree for two hours and then you leave the room. So having more blood, sweat and tears in this process where you really, really, really do it together, that makes the whole difference. And this people don't always like, but I seriously think any focus group should always be avoided in any product development process because there are so many great ideas killed in focus groups. Because you keep on asking those consumers, what do you want from a product that you don't know? In a time period where you still not live, you don't know how the world will look like. And, and you're going to take away all the cutting edge features. You're going to take away everything that's exciting. Because the focus group will always tell you, no, I want it this way. We tested our digital magazine. This is popular science, as you see, a prototype. And they hated it. I <laughs> really hated that magazine. They were like, we get dizzy, we don't understand how to move around. I want it just like a PDF. I want to flip my pages. I want it to look like my print magazine. That's what I want. <coughs> and if we would have listened to it, we wouldn't have done anything else than the, than the PDF. And uh, I don't think that, that this has happened. Now I'm going to break a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> this way. And, you know, of all of the futuristic magazine the magazines out there, Popular Science uh, is king of the hill. These guys did something really, really breakthrough. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's really worth taking a look at. So this happened at the press conference two weeks after the iPad was launched. And obviously, first of all, our technical people, this was like salvation. They were in heaven for <laughs> weeks. Because if Steve says something, it's cool. Um, 
But the interesting thing for us was that because we didn't take away those cutting-edge features, because we didn't listen to the focus groups, because we wanted to do something that was different, he liked it, he talked about it, so other people started to like it. It wasn't because it was the best solution, the perfect solution, or anything like that, but rather that we'd use new technology in a way that it hadn't been used before. And, and you get a lot of momentum around it, and then once you have that, you can always fine-tune. You keep on listening to people, and you can maybe polish a little bit on those most sharp edges that maybe disturb too many consumers because it was too hard to read or whatever. You have plenty of time thereafter to build a perfect product. But from the beginning, it's all about the brilliant idea. Finally, uh, the talent shortfall. <coughs> In our case, we felt that unless we can build this web of, of interesting people, we will not succeed with our product. In our case, it actually meant we literally moved from Stockholm to San Francisco. It's almost like you know when there's this huge concert and you need to be in a tent outside to get the tickets. We felt a little bit like that. Like, let's go to San Francisco and maybe we'll meet some people who'll tell us about this new beautiful, shiny, magical object called iPad and tell us how to do it. And and. It's interesting for, for the SEER activity that, in that case, geographical closeness made a huge difference for us. Because being there, you can access the right people, you get the information that is not public, public. you get the people who know things that aren't obvious things to know. So that web that we built around San Francisco in this project was crucial at that point in time. Because we were at the epicenter of, of a new technology shift. I think once that has happened, it's easier to move further away geographically. But at some points in time, you do need to be where it happens if you want to be the first one um, on the market. Then, for us, and I think for many industries, it's not only the media industry that's completely disrupted by technology. So is retail, or retail will be. So is banking. So is a lot of industries. But the common denominators of all these industries is that Technology people do not have central positions. Technology people in some of these organizations does not even exist. They're like consultants you use sometimes. Um, and unless those people are at central positions internally and are the drivers of, of technology and sorry of the innovation projects, I don't think we're going to be able to innovate as we can once we bring the, bring the geeks inside. And, and find a way of, of working together. And I think that's a great, great challenge for many, many industries right now, because it's, it's all happening with new technology. Then you see the consumer behavior, then you need to change. But unless you understand the possibilities with that, you cannot compete as you should. <laughs>